I can I ask you how you got into how you ended up at Volkswagen after that? Um. Well, I, that, I mean, yeah, that was. Um, so we were at, we're about ninety ninety eight now, I guess, and I'd done the Elise and enjoyed it, but I wasn't going to wait around another eight years for the for the next one. Um, and you know the the task of you know selling this, as I mentioned before, selling design work and being touting my wares around was really getting to me. I think also the the thing which always nagged me was um, through the years. Car design has always given you an opportunity for travel. You know, you know, you travel all over the mm. place, you know, and you know, you, you can just, you can just go all over the place and sit down at your desk and draw cars, you know, in different countries, and yet you're, you're, you're accepted and it's, and it's a norm. And you know, I'd stayed in the UK, and my all my uh, colleagues from uh, the Royal College of Art had now found good lives for themselves in Paris and Germany and the rest of it, you know. And I thought, you know, why haven't I done that? Why haven't I never taken that opportunity? And through the years at um, at Lotus, I always had thought about moving. I'd gone to, I nearly went to BMW once. I nearly went to uh, PSA another time. And at last minute, the, you know, the negotiations fell through. Just after I did the um, Isuzu uh, show car for that Tokyo um, motor show, Jay Mays asked me if I wanted to go and work at California or Audi. And... I'd always regretted that I didn't say yes to him then as well. So I always had this nagging thing that I wanted to to play in the big leagues. And also, you know, at Lotus, you know, we'd done everything on a shoestring. We'd done this car and it was fantastic. But, you know, it wasn't the next step was would have been more of the same, I guess. So I wanted to I wanted to go back in the big leagues. I wanted the opportunity to travel. And so when the opportunity with uh, um, Michael Arney rang me up and um they were looking for someone to uh, replace him. He was leaving that operation, come back to the UK. And so I took the job. And it was it was a real baptism of fire because, you know, I, I hadn't, uh, I'd, I'd designed stuff, but, you know, suddenly I went to this beautiful studio in uh, Sitges near Barcelona. Fantastic facility. Um, just fantastic designers and um, modelers and workshops. It was just a really you know, a beautifully set up operation and they got through so many projects and worked so fast. And, you know, I was, I was pretty uncomfortable there. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't keep up initially. I was in charge of exteriors, but it's what I wanted. It was, it was, it was almost like a sabbatical to go back and find your feet again. And, and, uh, one of my, one of my most challenging things was, um, we did a show car called the Seat Formula and, uh, my boss at the time said, oh, I need to see some headlight proposals, you know, some for, for the lights. And at Lotus, we never, ever designed headlights because we always took them from another car because we couldn't afford to tool them up. And so I'd never even thought about designing a headlight ever before. I just used to go through catalogs looking for someone else's headlight. And so that was one of the, that was one of the most challenging things to me to actually do a headlight. But... Um, no, we did. We did loads and loads of, of uh, fantastic projects there, and we worked on Golfs and Audi A3s and Audi A6s and Bentleys and Seats and all sorts of stuff. And you know, it was really, really exciting. And I'd met loads of great people there. That's when I first I did know Matthew Bevan beforehand at Royal College of Art, but that's when I became very good friends with him. And were you guys there at the same time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Matthew Bevan was there, but also people like. Um, Alex Malvau was there. Um, Alejandro Messinaro was there. You know, a lot of uh, top guys were there at, at the same time. And and and, we, and uh, brilliant work. Really, really. You know, Ackerman Scheidt was my opposite number doing interiors, and I was exterior, so I had, to, had a, a little office of Ackham. And so, we, you know, it was, it was a really credible place. Amazing. Um, I... Again, you you don't you don't have to get into this at all. But um, you, would you would you be interested in divulging why you left there? O- not on really. A, okay. All right. <laughs> not really. Okay. I just. I, I mean. I mean no, yeah, it's, I, it's I, with. I, it's okay. I I just the the reason the reason why I ask is that um, you know the way that I felt that you handled the situation was 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 very admirable and and uh and um 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a... Um, it, it, it was, you know, I didn't get on to my boss, really. And, um, you know, so we, I had some difficulties with with, with uh, Volkswagen and, you know, and um, the politics and the rest of it. It, it did work out very favorably in, in the end with Varkas and, you know... Um, I did. I did have some issues there. I did have a. It did come to a, an uncomfortable end, and um, I didn't receive much support from the Volkswagen Design Organization in terms of my difficulties I had there. Uh, the one person I would like to mention who came through and really put his own reputation on the line was Thomas Ingerlath. You know, and he was. He wouldn't have been a. Uh, he would have been some sort of manager then, you know. But um, he really went out of his way to help me out in the difficulties I had there and resolve my issues I had there. And I'll always be very, very grateful to him for sorting that out. He really stepped out of line from the politics of the company and shows a great deal about his character. I th- I think that that's kind of you know what what um what what stood out for me in that story you know is just kind of doing the right thing and also sticking up for 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 one another when it might be uncomfortable you know in the short term and yeah. that there are these things that are at risk you know your 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 career is at risk so yeah. um it was more about that um julian so i we don't have to talk about that anymore just... <laughs> no it's all right it was fine it's just these things happen all the time you know um you know it's there's um it's a high octane environment design, you know. There's um, there's some big personalities in there, you know, and uh, some very very strong viewpoints, you know. Um, design is like that, you know. It's um, you know a lot of creative people are very strong minded, you know, and they've, they've got a very strong sense of belief. And you know, when you're designing something which is, which you know you know, you know very well, we, we're designing products which are going to come out in four or five years' time and we're asking companies to um, risk hundreds of millions of dollars in our taste and our viewpoint about how the world's going to be. We're saying it's a gamble for them. We're, we're, we're saying that we're going to a company and saying, hey, look, I believe this is the right car for us to build, you know, and can I have half a billion dollars or whatever? And, you know, believe me, this is the thing to do. Don't listen to the market research, and so you know design directors do have to have be, you know, um, have some confidence, you know, in what they and what they believe and what they do, you know, and it does lead to some some very very strong willed people around the patch who sell themselves and sell their people and sell their organisation, um, and some of these people have a very very strong sense of self importance. Let's let's not uh, let's let's be honest about it. Yeah, there you have it. That's my little bit of preaching for you. Okay. <laughs> so that was your that was your baptism of fire in Europe, and then you went you returned to the UK. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in all honesty, you know, I I I think um, um, living in Barcelona was beautiful and it's it sunny and it was great. My family, in all honesty, didn't settle particularly well there, um, and having had that difficult political situation um, with with that particular. Um, company um, I wanted to return home and I wanted to work with friends you know I've always always believed in working in a family environment I've always always believed that design should be fun and that you can swap ideas backwards and forwards and you should not be intimidated by your manager your boss or your director I believe you know because I've, I've come from as I said my background has been as a very shy and reserved little guy who full of passion about design, but very, very quiet, you know, and I believe a balance of people of a lot of bravado and people are very, very quiet, you know, um, everyone's got to find their way of expressing themselves, you know, and the opportunity I had there to go and work with my good friend Ian Callum, you know, was, was uh, something I just couldn't resist. If you think, you know, through the years, Ian had been at TWR, and very much had reinvented Aston Martin. I'd been at Lotus and sort of reinvented Lotus in my way as well. And then suddenly we had this opportunity with Jaguar to reinvent Jaguar. And that was that was just fantastic. You know, I thought, okay, two of us coming together, working with a friend, given the privilege of 
being part of the history of one of the most important car companies in the world was just something I couldn't resist, you know, and and, um, and it turned out to be everything I hoped it would be. Did that just, did, did that just kind of, did the opportunity just present itself at the right time? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, because it, um, it sounded very serendipitous almost. Yeah. I mean, it, it was very unfortunate because um, Jeff Lawson um, uh, passed away uh, through, through uh, stress uh, at the same time. Ian was going to be, Jay Mays had asked Ian to go and uh, run advanced studio at Jaguar working for Jeff Lawson. Um, and after Jeff's passing, um, Ian took over the helm and needed someone to replace him as the advanced design person. And so he called me up. And so the timing was just perfect. Wow. What a interesting time as well right because yeah jaguar kind of fallen into a bit of a rut at that point it's like this um that they i don't know but because i wasn't around at that time but my perception of that period was it was very much a an old man's car yeah i mean it's it's um it's a typical story of a of a of a, of a british luxury brand or several car companies have been through the same thing you know um I don't want to give you a big history history uh, about Jaguar, but Jaguar was founded very much on innovation and beautiful design. So all its most famous cars, be it the uh, E-Type, the D-Type, the XJ6, they were all like, at the time, they were very, very modern and very, very contemporary cars, you know, both in terms of design and engineering and, and, and where they were placed in the market. You know, they're very, 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 very exotic in, in their own way. Um, if, you, if you look at... Uh, if you go back to 1961 when the um, E-Type came out, that's when Porsche had a 356, right? So here was a car which Porsche 356 could do about 85 miles an hour, and Jaguar bought out their version of a sports car which could do 150 miles an hour. And can you imagine? Can you imagine us bringing out, you know, a Porsche 911? You know, does about 200 miles an hour. So we bring out a car for the same money which goes, you know. Um, 400 miles an hour it's it's that difference in in performance the incredible cars which really um changed the whole automotive landscape um so as a company grew through the 60s and 70s it had a it had a tremendous loyalty and a tremendous following but unfortunately it was also a time when market research started to become more popular it's a time when jaguar started to expand into the the u.s and when we talked to customers, when Jaguar talked to customers back then, they said, oh, for God's sake, it's the most beautiful car. Please don't change it. You know, they, they all look like Jaguars. They've got to look like Jaguars. So they, in terms of design, they, they just got stuck and they stayed in the same place for years. And um, Jaguar with the XJ from 1968 right through to 2005, 2010 almost, the car would look the same you know, for 30, 40 years. So it just got stuck in the, in the same place. And, you know, that customer loyalty was their main metric they tried to measure. So you've you got to imagine me. So I'm, I'm, I've been at, at uh, Volkswagen Audi. I've been around Ingolstadt. I've been around Volkswagen. I've, I've seen the, the cars coming out in the next five years. I know I've seen, I've been working on a new Audi A8. I know what it looks like. I turned up my first day at Jaguar. And I think, whoa, hold on, what's going on here? There's all these old-fashioned cars, the claim models of cars which look 20 years old, and these cars haven't come out yet. What's going on here? They must know something I don't know. You know <laughs> there, there was, there was, uh, there would have been the uh, the XJ from 2003 or four, whatever, about to come out. There would have been the X Type, you know, and, and I was in this funny funny zone where you know that is that's always a problem with a car designer with it being a car designer because you, you you interview at another job you go and get to another car design studio and you're not allowed to see the, the working environment you're not allowed to see what they're working on until you actually start and sometimes your first day in the office can be really shocking and it certainly was for me that day when i walked into jaguar first of all you know so we had this very regimented um structure in design and this is ian had only been in for six months um, pretty much all the designers had moustaches, you know. You weren't there. You remember, you know, people like Keith Helfer and Tad. They all had moustaches. They all wore grey suits. And, 
you know, they didn't talk to levels below themselves. You know, they, they were all very regimented, and they had all these old-fashioned cars, and they had the rules about how a Jaguar should be. I, there was a there was a, this big volume on my left on my desk about the rules of designing a Jaguar. You know, the most regimented thing I'd, I'd ever seen. You know, and and just a few weeks earlier, I'd been an Audi looking at these modern cars. So that was quite that was quite shocking, but. Um, we had to drag the management kicking and screaming into the uh, into the, the modern age over the years, and so that's what we did, you know. And that was that was that was so much fun. And you were part of that. And you saw all that going on. That was that was great. L- later on, but yes, I, I mean, if it, it's uh, it, I mean, it was for me, it, it was incredibly exciting. But all all of that stuff was very much in motion by that point. I mean, mm-hmm. I came along when we, I mean, when Jaguar was doing its first SUV, so that was exciting as well. But um, I guess probably not as exciting as when 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 you guys had just landed. Yeah, I mean, we we did we did various cars. You know, we did. Um we did that concept car, one of the first things RD6. we did. No, no, we did the R Coupe the, from when we did on uh, 2001, you know. Um, and that is all, a, it's the same crew, you know. That was that was Adam Hatton, Alistair Whelan, uh, Mark Phillips, Matt Bevan, you know, all that old crew, they were all on that car, Siobhan Hughes, you know. And we did that car and uh, did the Jaguar board was appalled. I thought, what the hell is that? It's a beautiful car. But it was just, they were so stuck in her way, they couldn't see it. They just, they just, they just couldn't believe it. But luckily, you know, through Jay Mays and Wolfgang Reitzler and, you know, the people at PAG at the time, they, they, they saw through all of that and they knew it was the right thing to do. Were um, you, were you and Ian very much aligned as to what needed to happen? Yeah, very much so. I mean, we, we, we always, we must play acted this yin and yang thing, you know, where he was a custodian of the brand. He had, he knew all the history books, and I would play this guy who um, didn't care about the past and was always pushing forward. And you know, the end result was the the uh, average of of the two of us. You know, and you know, they we used to have this banter in this studio, and we always used to, we used to make a point of disagreeing with each other all the time. And everyone knew that was how it was, and everyone enjoyed it. And it was, and it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, a really nice atmosphere. Wow. I just, I, I thought, you know, looking back on, you know, that 20 year period, it's amazing the transformation that that brand underwent. You know, it was, it did literally from, again, it's something that I never paid attention to. But after spending time in that company, I became a Jaguar fan and I'm still a Jaguar fan. And yeah. also going back at the, in, into the history and all that, and, and all that. And I, I just think that, um, you know, it's 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 being transformed into a, a contemporary um, contemporary brand that that young people could potentially, with the right products, could could get really interested into. But I think that now is another kind of watershed moment where there's all these questions as to what needs to happen in the next twenty years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, no, no I think you, you've got to keep moving, haven't you? You've got to keep reinventing yourself, you know. And I think. Um, <clears throat> You've always got to come back to the values, what the company is all about, and um, you know, lots of luxury brands do get confused about how they, you know, particularly with with so much activity in in the global scene of things, where you've got startups and you've got Chinese manufacturers coming aboard. You know, brand is so important for all those big manufacturers, be it Mercedes, Porsche, Audi. You know, and um, you know how you tell the story of your brand and what it stands for is so so important you know as cars become you know in terms of engineering come more commoditized and and driving is is you know the, the character of driving becomes less important it's that design and and the brand you know the brand story the brand narrative becomes so so important and how you explain that to people in the street and what car choices they buy is is really really um, important and, and and very very challenging, very very difficult. Julian, where do you stand on like um, something as, I mean, potentially trivial as surface language? Because I know that um, Ian was very much. I, I literally remember it might have been um, one of Hitesh's um, exteriors when he first started that they had these negative flicks on, and I remember him drawing, uh, taking ta- uh, tape over the dynoc perpendicular to the flicks to say like, you know, 
this shit needs to go, you know, get rid of this. So there was like this, it was always like a very much full sections to, 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 uh, to an intersection without any like negative flex, for example, were those things that were those, are those things that you kind of believe in as well? Or were you, were you ready to, to, to challenge that sort of thing? Um, I guess myself and Ian do come back to, you know, um, there are, there are lots of very, very fundamental rules about just using form languages, which, which are correct. And, um, you know, a lot of the work we do obviously starts out with getting the right proportions for cars and making sure proportions are fixed. And so that's particularly important to work with engineers to actually get the right architecture for a car. Um, and then, and, then, and then again, when you get to surfaces and lines, you know, just putting them together properly and constructing them properly is is the right thing to do. And you've got to do it like that. I do think you've got to strike a balance between the two, though, when it gets to actually trying to explore design a bit more. Because if you just keep on applying the same rules in such a fastidious fashion, you can just keep withdrawing back to the same place again, you know. And so how you challenge lines and forms and surfaces whilst maintaining, you know, the correct construction of, of lines and forms is, is really the key thing. So um, I think we did have times when, um, you know, some people in, in like, like Ian sometimes as well, when he would actually correct things, we'd probably over- correct things too much. And on some products, we'd, we'd, we'd spend two time, so much time actually perfecting lines and getting them right. And, and you, sometimes you wash out the excitement of things, you know. Um, and there's a big spectrum to, to, to hear. You know, to hear. See, I, I see lots of cars, you know, now which are covered in lines and flicks and decoration, you know, which, which, isn't, which isn't right, you know, and they rely too much upon that. And often those are the cars which have very, very awkward proportions. And their lines are there to do a purpose to actually disguise um, some poor proportions of the car so um i think you you do need to stick by those rules you do need to get those right but you've got to be very careful you just end up in a place which is just you know where you were before and just boring i mean so, you know there's there's a lot to be there's a lot to be said for that and i learned a lot um from being an environment i mean you know the cx75 for example had already been completed by the time that i start st- by the time that i started but if you yeah. look at that car it's just like such an excellent example of great proportions great surface treatment no fussy business and it's it it, it holds up as strongly as it did you know, how old is it now? It's it's more than 12, 13 years now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's a good example because that car, I mean, that car we built as a pure concept car. It was never meant to go into production. And um, it was meant to celebrate 75 years of, of Jaguar. And the idea behind the car was to do the most perfectly designed, best proportioned form out there. So, you know, the car has got a, a very, very central cabin. It's got the wheels of equal distance away from the cabin. And it's all about just perfectly balanced and proportioned. So, you know, that's a good example. If, if everything, if you have all the main ingredients are right there, right from the start, you don't have to actually do very much to actually get a beautiful car. And, you know, that's that was um, Matthew Bevany did that car and did a superb job on it, really. And it is absolutely exquisite and it and you and, and like you say that it, it stands a test of time because it it is just so perfectly proportioned now if you if you didn't have a perfect proportion to that car and you had to do something different and you had to squash it onto another form you might have to add some tricks and things and all over the car to make okay. it make it work but um you know that that isn't that's very much uh that's a philosophy i'd like to put into action if the architecture is actually perfect that's that that's I mean, there's everything to be said for the timelessness in that in that approach. The question is then, like, what does that look like in ten years' time or twenty years' time from now? If again you had the freedom to manipulate or or construct or have an influence on the architecture itself to come up with a, the same sort of not the same thing, but uh, the same um, 
design philosophies in terms of form purity, for example, where you don't have anything fussy. How do you innovate on that then? Yeah, I mean, as there are, you know, there are still loads of restrictions in, in, in designing cars, you know, so there are still things... You know, you still if you, if you go to, to these graduation shows, you see what work students are doing. You know, I, I always look at that because you know they they're less encumbered by um, by all the restrictions you have. You know, okay, you've got to get people into the car. That's the first thing. They've got to be look out the windows. That's the main thing. You know, but they they don't worry about headlights, aerodynamics, uh, you know, door openings. You know, they they they're free from all that that there's all the engineering restrictions. And a lot of the time, you know, even I go back to the cars, you know, I designed at college, you know, and all my colleagues designed at college hundreds of years ago, you know, we still wanted bigger wheels. We still wanted smaller headlamps. We still wanted flush glass. We still wanted to see, you know, so all those things, we're slowly starting to get those, you know, it takes a long time for them to catch up. So there's a lot of work out there, which still can't quite get realized because it doesn't have the technology to support it. And it's starting to happen, you know. This starting to, so things are starting to happen. So there's still a long way to go, you know. There are still things to actually even do even more beautiful proportions, even nicer surfaces, even cleaner executions, more, you know, even better detailing. You know, it's it's um, you know, car design will keep moving as technology keeps changing, and you know, um, I don't think the the want for the aesthetic will necessarily change much i think people you know there's not a lot of difference between the cars designers were drawing 40 years ago as the ones they're designing now but it's, it's just that they get closer to being able to execute them these days what, what are your what are your stance on grills because i this is a personal pet peeve of mine that like you know as we as we're moving into ele electrification and like very evidently so why is it that we are still hanging on to the shape of the grill, trying to rely on that in order to communicate the brand of the of the car when something like Jaguar, for example, has got so much in its DNA with regards to proportion and surfacing? Um, why can't why can't we explore something completely different? In terms, like I think a good, ex like not that this is a like the perfect example of, of of car design, but like some of the cars that Neo did, for example, some of their concept cars. I really liked the way that they had, um, you know, there's this real sculpture in the front of the car. There isn't this 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 you know grill shape or or the 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 Cayman, not the Cayman, the the Taycan, for example, is a great example as well, where we've got like sculpture there. Tesla Model 3 as well, although executed not great, agreed, but or gra uh, 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 granted, but I like the idea that we are not necessarily just projecting a graphic onto the front of a, a volume, because that's yeah, what I mean, we I, used yeah. to do. What, what is your stance on that, Julian, is, is the question. I mean, a car, a car is unusual because it does, as a product, it does have a face, you know, and and also it has a face which enters a space, like it enters a room, you know. You don't need so so, you know, a chair doesn't need to have a face, you know, and and a phone doesn't need to have a face, you know. It's but a car does enter somewhere and it makes an impression and people want it to make an impression as it comes into somewhere you see it coming down the street first time you look at it you see the front of it you know so people want it you know it's it's an extension of themselves and, and so the, the identity of it is very very important so whether it's a grill or something else you know i think the face of the car is very very important we come back to that discussion we had about brand you know particularly brands trying to stand out and establish themselves and and you know design is about communicating the product, you know, what the product does, who it's for, the people that, who made it, you know, the community, it's all those things about what a product, you know, is, is the product story. And the face is very, very important, you know, to that as well. So the grill is the obvious thing to do, you know, that is the obvious thing. You go right back to cars in the, in the, in the, the 30s and the 40s, you know, that's what they all wanted to do. That's established, you know, this is who I am. This is a brand I bought into. So to have that identity is very, very important. Now, whether you need to do it with a grill or not, you know, that that becomes an issue. There are some uh, practical considerations that electric cars still need cooling. But um, 
I think it, it just comes down to how to do that identity. And it's very difficult to do. I find it difficult to do an identity of a product if, you know, you, if you, it's like drawing a face with no mouth and no nose, you know. You need, you need some ingredients into it as well. So for me, the, the, the Tesla doesn't really say much to me, really. You know, it doesn't, it just, it's just, it's just a bit anonymous, you know, and I said, I, th I think it's, there's some way that I, I do think the Neo does a good job of it. You're right. I think, you know, the sculpture is very, very good, but consequently there's lots of cars which look like Neos now because they've all gone the same way. They've all, yes, it is, yes. So it yeah, does yeah, limit yeah. how much you can do there. So I think, um, it doesn't actually come down to the grill. I, th I think fake grills are probably not the way forward, but you know, you do need to think some way of doing the expression of the brand, you know, just just bear in mind, you know, people expect a car to enter a, a scene. Okay. You know, and that's very, very important. This is, I, I, I've always kind of steered clear of this sort of thing, and you've probably heard it on the, on the audio um, version of the podcast, but I kind of try and steer clear of the future of car design, you know, or trends or whatever the case is. But I think that you might be a very good person to maybe talk about that a little bit. What, um, what is it that you see happening, um, without stating the obvious, in in the next uh, I don't know ten years? Like, what do you what do you how do you see car design evolving over the next ten years? Um, I think it, it was it was in several ways has been a simpler simpler uh, time you know in the past for defining what people want in a car. Really, I think it. Um, I think it comes down to not just cars, but how people view products, you know, and what and how they express, you know, their views. You know, there's no doubt that the the whole notion of of a of a car and transportation being from our age, you know, it was a rites of passage. It was your it was your freedom. It was the open road. It was getting out there. It was you know, opened up your life. You know. And, and the car was the only way you could do it. The car was the only way you could travel to go and see your friends. It's the only way you could get out and uh, in the, in the big wide world and express yourself. You know, in a world where you've got Ubers and public transportation and pollution and all the rest of it, it's not like that anymore. You know, people, do, it's it's not such an acceptable thing to do to have a car and dream about having a car, and it doesn't represent that um, freedom of movement and expression. So cars. And brands have become, you know, it's, you know, the idea of doing something which is very, very overt and very, very, very strong um, can be quite unsavory as well for some people in terms of cars. And so how cars present themselves and how they present themselves in, in the modern world, you know, there will be lots of people who want big, you know, um, black SUVs with big grills in the front and the rest of it, you know, but it's not quite as simple as that for a lot of people. They don't, you know, that's a very negative image for a lot of people as well. So that balance and getting products right and how you appear and how products um, like cars actually express themselves is changing very, very quickly. There will be a lot of different ways to actually um, express yourself that way. But, but I guess the sad thing is that cars aren't as acceptable to a lot of people as they used to be and it's not it doesn't for young people it doesn't represent that that uh, freedom of movement that escapism you know which was so important and you know when i when i was young so that that so i think you will see you will always get you know fancy cars you'll always get rolls royces and you'll always get ferraris and they'll be very very expressive and they mean a lot to a lot of people but you will get a lot of just anonymous transportation devices as well out there and then um You'll have this huge section of mass market vehicles jostling for position. You know, so many brands which you won't really understand and how you actually um, break out as a design from that group is it's going to be very tricky for a lot of people. Yeah, I think I, I, the landscape moving forward is going to be... I, there's going to be a lot of different things that, that we're going to see. And I think, um, I mean, particularly around here, it doesn't we could quite easily not have a car, you know, because the public transport is so, is so great. Where we, 
I mean, I I use it on a uh, on a daily basis because I'm lazy, but and also because I like driving. But I think for the most part, like um, you know, particularly where we are, um, the only reason why somebody would really have a have a car is for the odd long distance trip, and I think those like subscription based uh, models for for that sort of thing have yet to be mastered in terms of the ease of use. I mean, short term short term driving. Sure, you know, there, there's some really good options out there. I mean, partic- again, particularly over here, I don't know what it's like in the UK. But I mean, you've got things like Zipcar, right? Where you've just got an app and you can go, uh, go up to a car and, and use it there and then without filling out a ton of paperwork. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, um, I haven't seen Zipcar in Leamington, but, uh, you know, we have, we, have, we have Uber and stuff like that. I, I guess what's... Um, I guess, I guess what's... Um, Something I I I I don't necessarily subscribe to is is you know these these huge bullish SUVs which are getting you know which a lot of people think as as um, a mark of success you know I, I don't like all these huge cars I think that's that's a real shame I, I, someone posted on Instagram the other day a picture of a a Lamborghini Urus and parked in front of it was an original Fiat five hundred you know. And you know you can imagine the difference in scale, but also in character. What you know, what those companies are trying to, what what the owner of the car is trying to say. You know, if you go back to the fifties and sixties when people drove around quite happily in a Fiat Five Hundred, you know, and that was sort of just a fun thing. You know, it was efficient and it's fun and it said something about you that you were just a just a just a you know very relaxed sort of guy. And then now we're forced into these massive cars these dark windows like driving around some sort of fortress and yeah. get out of my way you yeah. know yeah. It, it, it tells a very very different message and that that does worry me a bit, bit i think we know as designers we need to question the image we're trying to portray for the people actually inside the cars and what we're trying to do to 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 integrate into you know the big wide world what message are we trying to say to people about what, what's what's right to, to how to to um Actually, represent yourself as a, as a, as a driver, as a person. You know, why do why do you have to go around telling, forcing everyone out of your way, and just telling you, you everyone how rich and powerful you are, and better than you are than the next guy? Why is that so important? You don't walk down the street doing. Some people walk down the street doing that. But people generally don't do that. But in a car, they it's it's sort of okay to do that. That seems weird to me. Dieter Rams has got a great quote that um, myself and Carl like to laugh about a lot where he said like um, he was fighting with the marketing people at, when he was at Brown because of the size of the font. And he was like, when you go into a room, you don't go around shouting your name at everybody, you know, and that's the reason why he wanted to have something really small because of the, the, um, the kind of, I guess, the kind of person that he is and the kind of person that he um, – uh, I think the kind of character that he felt represented the the brand, you know, understated but classy, elegant, and um, it doesn't have to have big shouty messages all over it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Have you seen any um, interesting, like again, I hate to use this term, but like micro mobility solutions that you think like there could be something really interesting developing here because we're seeing like, okay, the electric skateboards are happening um, like pretty solidly. And there's been some really cool products that have, that have, have shown up in that space. You're starting to see electric. I mean, again, it's on water, but like electric surfboards and, um, I w- and, and, and then in the, in the mobility space, we've, we've seen in, I mean, Renault seem to be quite ahead of the curve with the Twizy, for example. Is there anything that you think is 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 uh, is really interesting? Yeah, I think it is. You know, I was in uh, Cambridge a few days ago, you know, and they've got these electric scooters all over the place where you seem to just, you know, you pick one up and you just dump it wherever you like, and someone else picks it up and takes it away, you know. And that, you know, that's that's a, a, a you know, it's a dream. It, it I think it's um. It, it, the UK is is particular in the fact that the weather is pretty bad, and also you know the car does rule a lot of these environments. So a lot of these integrated mobility solutions plainly work much better in some cities than others. You know, um, 
I, but I, I think, I think there is, yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said for a lot, a lot of these systems to, to pick up and run. It's really, it's, it's, again, it's a bit sad that they have to try and share, uh, you know, road space with single individuals and massive great SUVs, you know, that's, that's the problem, isn't it? You know, they've got, they're both fighting for the same thing. So you want to transition to one or the other, don't you? And it's, um, it's, uh, but yeah, you know, it's 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 a very interesting time and an time to change as well, you know. And when you get these things up and running, as I saw them in Cambridge, and it's so easy, and all of the, the roadways are marked out for them correctly, it's it's very inspiring to see that happening. But unfortunately, a lot of uh, cities in, in the UK and also abroad just aren't set up for this yet, you know. The car still rules, you know, and unfortunately, cars are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and people. are because of things like COVID are getting drawn back into them more and more and more. What is your stance on pedestrianizing city centers? <laughs> sorry, I just, I, sorry. I'll, 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 we, we, we can talk about something else. You can talk about whatever you want. We can talk about <laughs> motorbikes if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess it's all right. It's nice enough. You know, I like, it's good. You know, fine. You know, I like, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, because you know Lem High Street, you know you know it very well. That's been pedestrianised since COVID happened, but they're going to open up again. Oh, Lem, I didn't know Lem, that. Lem, Lemington High Street, you know, and, and that's pretty the parade. That's and that's just a backward step. So that's all I'll say for okay. now, right on it. So, okay, enough of that. Enough. Carl will be interested in that. Carl will be sitting in California, just thinking, "Oh my God, are they really?" <laughs> so, well, I remember, I remember they um, they pedestrianised the Coventry City Centre, which. Um, Became a pain in the ass, but but honestly, it's also at the same time driving through the center of Coventry is also became really difficult as well. So it kind of makes sense in in some areas, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I yeah, that's I was just interested to know what your stance on it was because you such a hardcore uh, petrol head and driving enthusiast. Yeah. Well, so. I mean, I mean, London is. I mean, London are now going to have uh, they're going to change pedestrian crossings. The pedestrian crossings are always green, and the cars, when they come up to them, they then have to request a green light rather than the other way around. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. How so, how was I mean, that work? Would would it, are there just sensors in the road, or? I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. So you know, because the, the default position for a traffic light obviously is green, but it's actually going to be green on the pedestrian side. Now. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. radical. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense in London, I guess. Um, but, it's a nice notion. Yeah. I'm not sure it's going to work. Well, I'm anyway, not convinced, yeah. especially with the the van drivers, the tra- the transit van drivers. I can imagine a lot of aggression happening for sure, even more than what's what's currently happening. Mm. Uh, Julian, I didn't realize you were quite. I mean, I, I I realized in recent years, but at the time that you were such a hardcore bike person. Did you ever consider becoming a bike designer? I I would love to design a motorbike. In and you know. In this, uh, I have now a little a gap in my career, and I, I have, I would love to design a motorcycle, but I don't know, you know, that I don't know if I could actually do it or not, you know, because there are. You know, Martin said something really interesting on the subject that he likens it to to designing an interior, which I never really considered before, but I guess it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, there have been motorcycles designed by car designers, which are just awful. And you know, and maybe you should you should just uh, maybe you should just let it, let the experts get on with it. You know, I love motorcycles and I have a very keen interest in them. And you know, I see some motorcycles and I think I could do better than that. But um, other the good motorcycles I look at, I thought, God, I couldn't do that. That's that's too good. What what is so is there I, anything that's like the pinnacle for you? What is the Ferrari Dino for you in in uh, in motorcycles? Well, I think I think stuff that MV Augusta does is, is, wow. is fantastic. The F four, yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and that uh, that Super Veloce is, is Veloce is, is a beautiful bike, you know. It's, and so that you know they do they do great stuff, you know. I, I couldn't I couldn't get anywhere near that. And I you know I'm very keen on KTM's as well. I've got uh, four KTM's, and I just I just like that that I just like the the the, the character comes through on that, you know. And, on, on, on those bikes and what is it what is it for you that makes the KTM so special because um, that's not something that I would have necessarily associated you with 
I could see no, you on I, a I on do. a Ducati or an MV or something like that. I mean, that's that's what I would have pra- placed you on if if I was. A- I, I, well, I've I've I grew up on dirt bikes, so I've always been into dirt bikes, and so um, KTM is obviously built around dirt bikes and enduro bikes as well. So that's what I, I like. But I have bought all of the road bikes as well. Um, also, I, I'm I I did a great trip down to Kiska, you know, design in Austria. We did a we did a, a run with them. And I saw around a place and I met the guys. Um, and I do like to buy, I mean, that's a nice thing for us car designers. We, we know, we look in the street, we know who's done which car and what the rest of it. And, you know, you, you, you sometimes think, well, I want to buy, I know the designer did that car, that motorbike. I want to buy, you know, I want to buy his thing. Yes. You know, I know the story behind that, you know. And, and that, so I think it's it's my fondness of those guys at Kiska and seeing their operation and seeing their office and, and going up riding motorbikes with them, you know, it gives me a little bit of personal attachment to that particular brand. So that's, that's why, uh, that's why I, I, I like those. And I, I do like, I do like the brashness of them and, and, uh, and, you know, any product which you switch on and it says on the, on the dash panel, ready to race. <laughs> so on PC, it was up on the instrument panel, you know. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's just funny, isn't it? I think it's, you know, so it's not taking itself too seriously. I do like that. It's very, very, very funny, yeah. Um, Julian, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I guess we probably should wrap up soon. And I, I wanted to, before asking what, advice you might have for for young whippersnappers wanting to become designers i wondered if you would um if you would be able to share what your next steps are if you have any um well i, I mean i, I really I, talking about my time at jaguar i've i've been very very lucky at jaguar i've had a, i've had uh, 21 years there and i've always believed in creating a very very vibrant open atmosphere where people can really thrive and enjoy themselves you know um that's very, been very very important to me you know all those years working with Ian Callum as my boss he was never really my boss he never really told me to do anything and we never fell out on anything and it was just so enjoyable for myself and the whole Jaguar family you know and I and there's not many people who have a period of 21 years of not really being told off or told to do something he didn't agree with, you know. So I'm the luckiest guy enough to have that period at Jaguar, you know. And the team we put together and the team we had there are just the most fantastic individuals. And I've learned so much from them and they've been so supportive to me. And I'll, I'll always forget that. Uh, I'll always remember those, those, those fantastic times there and, really what the people have taught me about how to interact with people and how to inspire them and how to create them so that's been a really good thing you know that chapter is close to me now you know i've i've i'm very very happy where i've ended up you know um i could walk away from my whole car design career now feeling i've got nothing else to prove you know i've i've done a lot of very exciting vehicles I work with some great people. So going forward, really, I've got a bit of a respite now, and I'm just looking for something really, really interesting. You know, I think um, the right project is very, very important. Doing something which actually is makes a statement, changes the automotive landscape is very, very important to me. But also working with the right group of people is is equally important to me as well. And finding those two things in combination is, is, is what's so important to me. I just enjoy talking about design, doing design with other people, um, talking to all sorts of, you know, you know, the relationship you have with clay modelers is, you know, and alias modelers is, is always really fantastic. You know, you've got two skills there which are, which are somewhat different, you know. But the friendship you can have by creating something with a great deal of shared passion between you know, a team or just a couple of individuals is, is so inspiring, you know. And so that's what I want to find again in my life, so that, and, and something new, a team of people who can really sh- share, you know, an inspired vision is, is, is what really uh, motivates me now. So I've just, I'm, I just see what comes along, you know, and, and see what I can find. Um, I've been so lucky to have so many projects which 
have just been so in, in, enjoyable and natural to me and almost like a second nature. And I just want to find that again somewhere else. I can only second that um, that feeling or sentiment towards the relationships that you build in your working environment, and that I experienced when I was at at at, at Whitley. I mean, I couldn't have I couldn't have asked for a better kind of um, introduction to to the industry. And I I remember, you know, what a there was something very special about that. I think about that period as well. But the 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 culture that I mean, both you and Ian basically set up there and um i guess nothing lasts forever and um yeah we've we we need to move on but i i carry that with me all the time and i just it frustrates the hell out of me when i when i'm in other situations or other studios where there's constant conflict you know and i just i i've that was the best example of how to do things because enjoying what we do and enjoying it with the people that we do it with is so important ultimately that's why we get into this because we're not just doing another job we're doing something that we love and i think the people are absolutely paramount to 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 that experience which is something theme that seems to be a reoccurring one in your story yeah absolutely no no it's very very important to me um lastly i need to um, ask you what um, advice you would have for young people wanting to become designers um, I, I, I recognize it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to stand out you know to, to get your ideas adopted and, and you know either to get a job and also to win a job and the rest of it um, I think uh, you know, the big change for me, you know, I mean, we talk about all these changes of technologies and the rest of it, you know, um, I've done half my career without computers almost, you know, with no, no, uh, no Photoshop, no alias, no internet, you know, well, not, not half my career, but, you know, so um, I guess it's, it, the, 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 I think the particular challenge is coming up with new ideas, you know, and what inspires you, what what gets you doing something different, what, you know, like that. And I, I think the the wealth of information available on the internet is is both fantastic but also a curse, you know. And I think we see so much stuff which is just the average of what people have just scanned through the internet and, and seen. And so I'd encourage people to try and be inventive, trying to recognize people when they recognize times when they've been inventive when they've done something different and i'd encourage people to um young designers to talk to colleagues and try to do things collaboratively um you know talk to technical people modelers um alias designers try to just try to distill you know a team of people and come up with new ideas don't just just try and you know look at what's out there and just be there's just too much influence out there from other sources. There's too much information available, you know, which is taking over, over that creativity and that inventiveness, which is, which is, I think, a, a frustration for me. When I see some young designers, I'm just, it's very difficult to see that spirit of invention in a lot of work. You see so much of the same thing. You see so much of the same process. You see so much of being, people have seen the same thing and, you know, found the same image and worked of it. So, just trying to show that you can invent, do something different, um, work with, with uh, more experienced designers, work with modelers, work with engineers, and just come up with new ideas um, is is the challenge. And I think you've got to demonstrate that to me as well, really, that you can, you can do that. You can come up with new ideas. You can actually mature them by talking to other people and cross-pollinating things and, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. So that that is really it's, it's it's encouraging designers to just just talk, work together, you know. Just just try to just not take such strong influence from all these information sources. You know, you've got to invent something new. You know, the stuff you're seeing on the internet has already been done. You got to do something new. That's that's what I'd say. Great advice, Julian. 
thank you very, very much. I'm so glad we've been able to do this. It's taken an age to set this up, but um, we've done it. And uh, I, I'm just, yeah, it's great to chat to you. Okay, well, thank you, Sam, and I'd really appreciate what you're doing as well, because, you know, spreading the word and spreading all your advice and all these opinions is, is really useful to uh, to all sorts of people. I wish there's someone like you when I was uh, 15, 16. I would have learned so much more, got into the industry much earlier. Thank you. So well done. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.